Growing up, we had a small farm with a few apple trees in upstate New York. It gave me the impression that the world was bountiful and easy. But it's a lottery, isn't it? Where you're born, the forces that align against your happiness. It's all just a roll of the dice, really. My name is Leila Halal, and I leave for Iraq in the morning. But tonight, my mom has insisted on getting family and friends together for a celebration dinner. I'm so proud of you, Leila. But I'm not going to lie to you, sweetheart. I'm nervous. Come on, mom. It'll be fine. When Mosul fell in June of 2014, I was on my first flight to Iraq. I knew this airport from trips to visit family in Egypt. It was once the gateway to my childhood adventures. Now it felt unfamiliar. The lights were too bright. Everything felt too sterile, just a mall on the edge of calamity. I needed to get out of there. I needed to be useful somehow. Just a few months after the fall of Mosul, we're at two million displaced Iraqis and a quarter of a million Syrian refugees in northern Iraq alone. They are all dentists, architects, engineers, housewives, mothers, fathers, sons and daughters. And we're trying to feed every one of them. I stopped for lunch with a local colleague from Baghdad. What was it like during the war, Youssef? I was in Baghdad for shock and awe. My family and I, we were in an underground shelter. We stayed down there for days. There were rats. They were scared too, very active. Someone always had to stay awake to keep them off us. We took a TV and generator down there and played Xbox and shifts while the bombs dropped. It's a hard thing to explain seeing your country dismantled, wondering if it will ever come back, trying to do what you can to help. Northern Iraq is the only part I've seen, but it's beautiful. I think of the farm I grew up on back in New York, of my apple trees, of how things that seemed so far apart have had their distances demolished. And the food vouchers? How are they working out for you? My new daughter-in-law has moved in with us. It's not enough food for everyone. One moment, ma'am. It's my job to go out into the field and engage the people, to hear their concerns and discover their needs. But all it really means is I listen, listen to their stories. A few hours later, as we approach the base, we see a Peshmerga helicopter coming in for landing. We rush to catch it. We get there as the newly arrived Yazidis reunite with their families. No more people are coming off the mountain today, but we pulled a bunch of children out of the enemy territory about a week ago. Brave kids. Do you have a family name? Bushar. We don't know it at the time, but these men are just hours away from taking part in the Sinjar offensive that will break the insurgency's hold on the mountain. Theirs will be the first true decisive victory over Daesh in Iraq to date. The battle will make news all over the world, and though it is thankfully very few, some of these men won't be alive by the end of the day. We leave the base and head off to meet the Bouchard family. The Yazidi boy's name is Nasser. His parents are Hakima and Khalid. Eventually, Nasser and a group of boys managed to escape when all the adults went off to fight. Back in their shipping container, where they now live, Nasser's father asks me, How tightly can you hold your child with love without breaking them? How long can you hold them before you must let go? Those are the questions that fled through his mind as he embraced his boy on that landing pad. I can't imagine the balance of heartbreak and gladness they all felt in that moment. 
Yesterday, the Peshmerga began breaking the siege in Sanjar. Are you excited to return home? I'm tired of home. The Yazidis have always been persecuted here. We are not wanted. I hope to take my family to Europe. I want my children to go to school, to the movies, to eat when they're hungry, live a normal life. Not like this. The most fundamental thing you can do to keep a human alive is to feed them. That mission takes many forms. Some of us fly planes, haul food, and organize camps. And some of us collect stories. I've learned that telling your story to someone, making sure the human conversation doesn't leave you out of it, it's the fundamental part of staying alive. Tomorrow, I'll hear another story. And the day after that, and the day after that, another. And on and on. And each story will end on a similar note. The idea that surely, somehow, somewhere, a better world is possible.